What is it? Why does it come to some? Why does it not come to others? I'm, uh, I'm perplexed by the topic. I've lived it with my wife. If you don't know Susan's situation, she was diagnosed 15 years ago, and the doctors, all that they said 15 years ago, they've, they've proven to be right. And for 15 years, we've walked a road where we've been asking God for healing. And today, I'm going to talk to you as best I know how, with all kinds of uncertainties. What does the Bible have to say about healing? So I'm going to sit for most of this sermon, contrary to what I normally do, and it's probably going to sound more like a, just a personal journal, because it's taken me 15 years to get to this sermon today. So I've thought about all the words, and it's better for me to probably stick with the manuscript more than I would usually do, so that I don't wander off and say something that I didn't pre-think, because quite honestly, I'm so baffled and yet so confident all at the same time. There are two mistakes when we talk about healing. I think they're misunderstandings. I think one mistake is that some view healing and miracles as the confessionist approach. I'll call it the confessionist approach. The confessionist approach is kind of like the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it. If you can state it, your words have the power to mandate its existence. I think that's a mistake. From my experience, I think that's a mistake. Why? Because I've tried that. Susan has tried that. She's tried throwing away her crutches and walking without the crutches. and She does it at home, but I don't think that the confessionist approach to healing is the right approach. I think the opposite side of the confessionist name it, claim it, blab it, grab it approach is what would be equally as wrong. It would be the cessationist approach. The cessationist approach would also be mistaken because the cessationist would say that miracles happen in the Bible, but they do not happen today. I think that's totally wrong. I don't believe that for a second. Johnny Erickson has been used by God throughout the entire world. And I really don't think that there was a sin issue in Johnny Erickson's life that would merit God breaking her spine and snapping her spinal cord and making her quadriplegic for the rest of her life. I don't think that was a sin issue in her life. I do think that God called Johnny Erickson to one of the most difficult tasks that a human being could possibly choose to endure and that is live a life now into her 60s, where since age 18, she snapped her spinal cord diving to shallow water in the Chesapeake Bay with her friends. But in the process of faith, Johnny Erickson has stood up and said, but God's still God. And I'm one of his children. So, I reserve the right to be wrong. I will not say one thing I do not believe. I will say it because I mean it. And I mean it, and therefore will say it. And everything that I say today, I'm going to base on the Word of God with my knees shaking and my future uncertain, except in one thing, that God who called me to this day has prepared me for years to get to this point. So those two mistakes... The confessionist and the cessationist, I think, now set us up for what does the Word of God say? I think there's one passage among all others that takes us more clearly to what God has to say specifically about sick people getting healed. It will be found in the New Testament book of James in the fifth chapter. It's the clearest of the New Testament passages on healing, and it says this in verse 13 all the way through verse 16. Is anyone among you in trouble? All of us at times will be in trouble. What kind of trouble? It doesn't say. It just says, if you ever have trouble, then pray. Don't forget that. When you face trouble, God says you can pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. 
But do we only sing songs of praise when we feel happy? No. Other places in the Word of God says when you don't feel happy, you need to sing songs of praise because praise is a declaration of your choice to walk in joy in the midst of unhappy circumstances. But he says, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're, if you're happy, sing songs of praise. And then he says, is any among you sick? Let the sick call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil all in the name of the Lord. We're going to do that as the service closes today. We're going to create space. No matter how long it takes us before 11 o'clock, if we don't finish before 11 o'clock, the people will come in for the 11 o'clock service and wonder, what in the world's going on there? I just want to tell you, if you want to trust God for a new journey in your faith process, I'm going to tell you in advance, that's where we're going to end this service and people are prepared to anoint you with oil. But if you are sick, you, God says, need to ask them to be anointed with oil. We will not start splashing oil on you like you're a bunch of cattle. We're not going to do that. We're going to just step into and alongside of the Word of God. And the prayer of faith, the prayer offered in faith, it says in John 5.15, will make the sick person well. The prayer of faith, the oil has no power whatsoever. The oil is a symbol in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit's presence. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And listen carefully. It's the very next sentence. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. It's an interesting connection between sin and sickness mentioned in the same text and context. It's a very interesting twist. Let's continue with James 5 and verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now notice this. This word in the Greek does not mean a physical healing. It means you confess your sins because God is going to heal you at a much deeper level than what happens just in your physical body. He's going to heal you from this ultimate sin that separates you. It's a disease that is terminal, and it's terminal for eternity. It separates you from God. He says, no, no, when you confess your sins one to another, when you confess your sins to God, you will now know the healing that only Jesus can provide. That's the word in Greek. Note that the word healed is a different word for healing here. This word is the word which means not physical healing, but a deeper healing than just that which happens within the physical body. We'll get back to this in a few minutes. So as we dissect these verses... I see three observations that I'd like you to consider with me. The first observation is this. God still heals people. Would you say it with me? God still heals people. In this church where I've had the sheer joy and privilege of pastoring, I have seen miracles. I've seen them. I've seen the miracle of lost people coming to Jesus. I could point. Yesterday I sat in a breakfast gathering and I listened to men give testimony of the transforming power of Jesus and his forgiveness as they confess sin and as they stepped into his healing. I've seen that, but I've also seen physical, miraculous healing. Let them tell you about it rather than me. It'll be more pleasant for you to look at and listen to anyway. So look at their faces and listen to Dave and Megan. These are our people in our congregation. Listen to their story. Hello, Dave and Megan Schaub's testimony, please. Somebody step up from behind that shadow and talk to me. Do you have it? Is there a technical difficulty? Where should I go from here? I didn't hear you. Don't have it. Let me summarize it. Gosh. 
about uh, 15, 16 years ago. There was someone in our congregation who was diagnosed with cancer, and he asked us, I'm going to trust God for healing. Would you please anoint me? And I believe that a public service would give glory to God, so could we have a healing service? And so we did. And there was a lot of attention given, and there was a lot of preparation. And I remember in a different location, it was a, um, it was just a very special night. And then at the end of that uh, night, after that person had been prayed for, we opened it up to uh, other people. Um, Josie Smith was there that night, and uh, Josie would give a testimony. She's not here, moved away. Uh, but the second folks that were here, and we do have a video, so you'll get it online. Uh, go back and you'll find it this afternoon, I'm sure. Dave and Megan Schaub had trusted God even before they were married. She told him on their second date, look, I want to adopt kids. I don't want to have any biological. And if you're not interested in that, you should just drop me now and go get someone else because I really don't want to. I want to have children, but I want to adopt. She just had this mercy gift. She's lived it out all the years that I've known her for 22 years. David said, wow, that's so special. What, now you have it? Well, let's bring it on. Uh, we've been married 22 years. I've uh, been coming here for 22 years. Three kids. Three kids. Uh, Thomas is 23, Anthony's 19, and Samantha, Sam, is 16. So shortly after we were married, we started the adoption process with that with Douglas, and we had um, our first foster kid. Yeah, his yeah. name was Thomas. And we just kind of continued that route. We have five kids um, in our home. Yeah, we had five kids kind of come and go, and um, it was always heartbreaking when you're a foster parent because you never know whether you know, get to keep them or not. And our intention was always to keep whoever came in the house. You know, so, we, we just said, like, you know, we got to do something permanent here because we can't keep breaking this kid's heart right. and breaking our own hearts, too. So then I thought we should try to have our own kids and, and have some permanent children for Thomas, some siblings. So we began that whole process, fertility specialist, that went on. And basically, um, one night, I had gotten a terrible phone call December 18th, um, 2001, that... My brother had died, he was 38 years old, with an aneurysm. And like immediately after, the doctor had called us to say... Yeah, that same day. Yeah, the same day, like, we've done all, everything we can do, you guys can't have kids. Yeah, just, you know, basically, so it, yeah. it's not going to happen. Right, and yeah. then we're just like, okay, we'll just stick on the whole adoption route. So we knew what we had to do. And um, shortly so, after, I guess, we had gotten a phone call for a little boy named Anthony, who was two. He was already pretty far along the adoption process, so we kind of knew... Hopefully this will be safe and we won't lose this one. So he came in our house and he was great. Like Thomas fell in love with him right away. We fell in love with him right away. Yeah. And then um, all of a sudden, um, well, in the midst of there, we had come to the bubble church at, for a healing service to pray for one of the members who had cancer. So after we had prayed over the congregant who had cancer, they asked if would anyone else like prayer. And all of a sudden, Megan um, speaks up, and I'm looking at her like, well, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> and uh, because we're normally very shy people, and she says, you know, I would like prayer of healing over me because, you know, we've been trying to get pregnant. You know, then we went to this healing service, and Vince Steger um, prayed over Megan. And, um, you know, th then we had gotten the call for Anthony. And yeah, and, and so Anthony came in our home January 11th, and pretty soon after the healing service, um, I started getting very nauseous, and we just kept praying and praying all the time that I could have a baby. And... Um, so two months go by, and I'm telling my dad, he was going to help him, so I'm so nauseous, I, I just, I, I don't know what's going on with me, I've never been this sick before. So I went to the doctor, and um, I found out I was pregnant, which was good, the baby was healthy, a healthy normal girl, because, Despite all her yeah, all the, to try to destroy skull it. and yeah. crossbone, don't take this when you're pregnant, but anyway, so we found out uh, we were pregnant, and we it was actually a blessing in disguise that we didn't know ahead of time, ahead of the phone call for Anthony, because I think if I knew, we already had Tom, we would have a baby, and we might have said no to Anthony. Because so I was fine with two. Yeah. You know. So it was perfect that I did, Anthony was in our home for two months before I even knew I was pregnant, and he is just a joy. And um, it was just worked out, and their ages, everything was just perfect. They were just happy, perfect kids, and it was yeah. just a miracle. 
And then the, the interesting part is we had picked out names for this baby and I'm like about due and we couldn't come up with a name and one one night at three in the morning we both, both kind of woke up. woke up and said Samantha and um, we laughed we had no idea why we said the name. I didn't know where that name came from. Nobody in our family has that name. Yeah. It wasn't even the name we had thought of. Right. And right. then uh, so we looked up what Samantha means and Samantha means I guess in Hebrew it means God heard yeah. and I was like wow like <laughs> God heard. <laughs> And there'll never be a day in your life where God will not heal or hear, excuse me, there'll never be a day in your life where God will not hear you, but there may be a day in your life where God will not answer the way you just heard he did for them. But I do believe this. My first observation is God still heals miraculously today. It's not a cessationist point of view. So technically, if God did only one miracle from the day of Pentecost until present, cessationism would be invalidated. But I, I could give you more, many, many more of miraculous healings. In John chapter 5, we see uh, an interesting passage. Jesus is there by the pool of Bethesda. The Word of God specifically says this, verse 5. Uh, verse 3 and 10. Here a great number of people, disabled, used to lie. And then it specifies who were disabled. It says the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever pray for a sick person that they be healed and they were not healed? No. Not once. Second question. Did Jesus refuse to heal sick people that he saw with his own eyes while he was on this earth? Of course he did. It says so right here. It says that he went to the pool of Bethesda and there were many that were there sick. And he healed one of them that day. And he walked away. I just tell you this. I wouldn't have done it that way if I were God. I would go to Sloan Kettering tomorrow. In fact, I'd get there today. I'd probably get someone else to preach if I knew I had 24 hours to do this. I would get to every children's hospital. I'd get to every cancer ward. I'd get to every place I could possibly get to and I would heal every sick person I could see and get my hands on. I don't know why Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda and saw the sick, the lame, the blind, and the paralyzed. And the story tells us he healed one of them and the rest of them stayed in their sin. The only reason that I can come to that Jesus did that was an Old Testament verse in the book of Isaiah that says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord, but I know you. And I will always hear your cry. This may well, well be the biggest faith step you'll ever take in your earthly journey while on a heavenly destination. Will I wait for God to show his perfect plan that will always one-up my good plan? I think this theory is right. I think we will all show up in heaven one day and the first sound that we hear will not be the hallelujah chorus. I think it might well be the sound of, oh, no. Oh, oh, I get it now, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13 alludes to something like that when it says, I now, while here on earth, see through a glass dimly, but then one day I'll see face to face. And now see through translucently, but then I'll see through a crystal clear pane of glass. Oh, God. 
I get it now. You see, the faith question of your life and mine is this. Will we be okay with God doing things His way, in His timing, until we go from mystery to certainty, from translucency to transparency? Will we be okay with that? You see, this, I think, is the faith walk. Our Christian life, friends, is a faith journey. And faith is defined in the book of Hebrews as being sure of what we hope for and certain about the things unseen. So after this series is over, we're going right into a series called Running with the Giants. Why? Because it was so helpful and so memorable and so positive an experience last year. We're going to do it again this year. But Running with the Giants is is a series of people mentioned in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And it's people great in their faith. But listen to what verse 9 says. All of these people who are in the hall of fame of faith, all of them, it says, All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for them. They didn't all get their own way. Do you know why Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet? He cried out a voice of victory and redemption, but in his lifetime he never saw Israel redeemed. He died when they were still in their captivity. He's a great man. He's mentioned in the Word of God. So we need to understand this. In this area, we have every right to ask God for healing. We have every right to expect a miracle. But giants of the faith still trust God even when it doesn't happen because they believe there's something better in His all-knowing perfectly sovereign mind. The Lord will rescue me. It says from Paul's hand to Timothy's eyes, the Lord will rescue me. Here's a man in prison. He'll rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom to be glory forever and ever. Now, he didn't say bring me safely to the end of this earthly journey. No, Paul who wrote to Timothy lost his head in a prison. Why didn't God spare the apostle who wrote over half the New Testament? So God, we ask, are you rescuing me or are you bringing me? And the answer is yes. Yes. God is in the process of rescuing you while you're on this earthly journey and he will bring you to his ultimate perfection. This is why I think James mentions this word sin in its context. The greatest healing God does is not physical But spiritual, I'll say it again, the greatest healing that God has for you and me is not physical, it's it's spiritual. The healing of sin, which separates perfect from imperfection, is God's greatest miracle to humanity. That healing is available to all humanity because it is God's very greatest act of love and compassion. When Isaiah wrote, by his stripes we are healed, he is not obviously talking about every physical ailment, every single disease, every single time for every single person, but he says there will never be a sin that will not be forgiven. I will heal you and take you directly to my Father as though you never sinned. Before, God is more concerned, my friend, about my spirit, which is my identity, which is my eternal part, than he is about my body, which is temporal. God settled our identity at the cross. The healing of who we are as an imperfect sinner is guaranteed to be healed through Jesus, and there's no exceptions. He says so in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all, every single one of them, acts of unrighteousness. My body and yours is not who we are. The Bible says that my life is eternal, not earthly. My body is earthly, but my identity is eternal. My body reminds me of the curse of sin. My Lord Jesus reminds me of the cure of sin. We tend, especially as Americans, to emphasize our body 
over our spirit. <laughs> oh. We put some on, and we want to take some off. It's a body thing. I think that's what Isaiah means when he writes, by his stripes were healed. Stripes are, are the open wounds of the scourge's whip. Nine cords of rawhide. Each cord having individual bone spurs and leaded objects, whether they're stone or lead pieces. They were put in, woven into each of the strands of rawhide. And nine of them came together, woven and, and wrapped as one handle so that when the scourging whip came down, it tore the back open. Jesus was scourged 39 times, nine times. Nine cords at one time, 39 lashes. He's ripped open. And the, what, what Isaiah is seeing 640 years before it happens, by his stripes, the sin that separates eternally humanity from God was healed by Jesus. So contrary to what we Americans propagate in our culture, I don't think this life in God's eyes is about our body. It's about our spirit, which is wrapped up in this body for just a short time. So short that God compares the time that our spirit dwells in a body as the amount of time you can see your breath on a January sub-zero day. It's not very long. My life is not this life on earth. My life on earth is only a preparation for my eternal life. My life is not above this body. My body is only a dwelling place for my spirit and the Holy Spirit to give me opportunity to practice the Lordship of Jesus in a place of imperfection on earth until he chooses to perfect me through Christ's act of redemption in heaven for all of eternity. My body returns to dust. My spirit goes on to heaven. This is why I think Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body because God cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so the disciples were sent out by Jesus with authority to do miracles. And they came back all excited that they had power over the demons. And Jesus said, listen, don't rejoice that the demons submit to you rather rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Praise God. From time to time, we get to see miracles like we just saw with Dave and Megan Schaub. But the greatest miracle on earth is that our names are written in the book of life. And Jesus has healed those who will turn from their sin. Repentance means you willfully and intentionally turn from that pattern of behavior and you turn to Jesus, accepting his gift of salvation, and you make a declaration of the will that you're there to serve him. So the first observation I leave you with is this. God still does miracles. Will you say it with me? Just help me out. God still does miracles. He does. Second observation. God wants me to grow in my faith. We tend to focus on bodily healing. I'm quite sure God is not as focused on our body as we are. God's more focused on the process of what goes on within our thoughts, words, and actions. What we've learned here at Stonecrest, we call it the soul, how we think, feel, and act in the midst of difficulties in our body. But until we understand that very fact, that God's more concerned about our eternal part than our physical part, I don't think we'll ever fully understand the result that's focused in God's eyes, not on the act of healing, but on the process of the faith journey. You see, we tend to be concerned about what's happening to us, and I think God is more concerned about what is happening in us. While we're praying for God to work on a miracle of healing for the physical body, I think God is much more at work within us to reveal the truth about himself that will change how we think and how we feel and how we act every day. Even though it would appear that God is not doing anything because our body remains the same. Let me quickly personalize it and then I'm going to give her the words to say because this girl is the one that has convinced me Jesus is real. 
This is the woman that has influenced my thinking. This is the woman that I trust above every human being on planet Earth. And this is the woman that I've gone home and seen her in the chair weeping and thought that she was depressed, thought that she was struggling with something going on. Maybe she fell, maybe she hurt herself. And when I said, what's going on? She said, no, no. I'm just weeping for joy. Sitting on the lap of my Heavenly Father. Listen to what Susan has to say as for 15 years we've been walking a faith process journey. I went to my first college of prayer um, in April of this year, and I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, it was intense Bible teaching, prayer, praise and worship, and um, it was just a, a marvelous time where we really felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. In those times at College of Prayer, God really, really did a work in my heart. I went into it with, um, in a very dry, spiritual funk, and um, I feel like God really breathed fresh air into my life. My prayer life was transformed. My, uh, my daily walk with Christ was transformed and renewed. And God just did so much to me. I can't even begin to explain to you um, what a blessing it was to be present at that, that College of Prayer and the teaching that I received there. I went to the meetings knowing that oftentimes people experience physical healing at the College of Prayer. And so I was kind of anticipating, oh, maybe God will touch me, maybe he'll touch my physical body. But I came away realizing that he didn't touch my physical body, but he did something even greater for me. He really touched my heart. He healed my heart. And he renewed, um, I had a renewed, uh, revitalized relationship with him. And um, that was even more important than a physical healing. Someday he may touch my physical body, but right now I'm just so thankful for everything that he's done for me. And that's kind of where we're at. But because I've watched her, and because I, I just know that's just genuine to the core. You, you can put on a lot of faces on Sunday morning. You just, sooner or later at home, you get real. And I'm telling you, that's the real deal. That's the real deal. So it's been just this uh, ongoing uncertainty. So I... People have often asked me, why doesn't God always heal Christians? And, and, and I want to give you my best spiritual answer. I knowest not. I just don't. But what Susan and I have been learning is at the same time of physical trials and disease, there's a process going on in both of us, me vicariously, that requires faith in God's sovereignty and goodness, and that there is a higher good in the eternal part of her and I and us than the goodness of what physical healing could bring. She and I would both love that we could dictate to the king by conjuring up this Blab it, grab it, name it, claim it. You'd give it now because we believe you. And we've tried that. <laughs> the truth about healing, it's not what we think. It is. I think we tend as human beings, as Christ followers, we tend to be very result-based but I think that God is journey-based. How many of you are destination people? When you're going on vacation, man, you just want to get there. You stop for gas, and when you stop for gas, you tell one of the kids or your spouse, you ask them, would you go in and get Daddy a Big Mac or two double cheeseburgers and a fry? Would you do this? Give me an extra drink, get a bag of chips. Make sure you get all your potty stops done because what's implied in the destination guy that he's driving on this trip it means that until the gas gauge gets on empty again, we ain't stopping. 
That's the destination person. The other person said, hey, man, we got a 12-hour trip, man. Let's take three days to do it. <laughs> and we like the journey. Well, let me tell you, I'm a destination guy. You just ask my family. I'm a destination guy. And when it comes to healing, I'd be a destination healer. Just get the result, man. When do we see God the most? I'll tell you when I do. When I'm desperate. When life is going along smoothly, I just have a tendency. Maybe you do too. Maybe you don't. God bless you if you don't. I have a tendency to say, man, I, I think I can sleep in. <laughs> I think I'm going to take a day off. But I feel so good. No one's mad at me. No one's going, oh, no problem. Oh. James chapter 5. We get back to that passage. The very next verse, after God talks about the sick people getting well, he recaps the story of Elijah in just two sentences. It says this in James 5, 17 and 18. Now, he's just talked about any, any happy among you, let them sing. Any um, sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Then he says this. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. In two sentences, James reminds the Hebrew people of an Old Testament truth that they all knew from oral tradition. And within these two verses, in this journey of faith, God wants us all to have, he's giving us this process that I think is so, so important. So let's go to the whole story. You can't get the whole story. The whole story is found in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, who was a very, very wicked king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Elijah had gotten a word from God that it would not rain because of Ahab's wicked ways, and it wouldn't rain until God said to Elijah, it's going to rain. Until we understand that the faith journey is a process, I don't think we'll ever understand the healing that God's reasons for allowing illness and long-term circumstances is all about. So let me just note just three observations. I know the time is gone, but let me just at least state them. Faith comes by hearing. Faith begins with a word from God. When you're in a struggle... You're in a long-term situation. Go to the Word of God. Get a word from God. It's that word from God that is your anchoring point. It's the beginning of your faith journey. It's unique to you. It's God's Word to you. Go there. You say, where would I go? I want to give you a practical example. On Mondays and Fridays, there's a group. They meet in the lobby. They always start with a guy named Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers brings a theme for the day. They go from Oswald Chambers, whatever that theme is, they go, what does Jesus say? What does God's Word say? Old Testament, New Testament. And then they'll take you to the third step. How do we apply this to our life? Now, if you have a need in your life, if you have an uncertainty, I want to encourage you. Every Monday at 6, every Friday at 6, you'll find about 6 to 9 people sitting in that lobby they elevate Oswald Chambers and they just say, hey, he's a man that used by God over a century ago. Let's start there and then they go to Jesus. Listen, whether you do it with them, whether you do it alone, whether you do it in a public place or a private place, you and I need a word from God because God's word to us is our promise. It's where we anchor down and tether up and say, okay, I'm not moving from this promise, God. For Susan and me, it's been 15 years. But you've got to hear a word from God. Second observation is that faith continues regardless of what you see. We live by faith and not by sight. So what do we do in the meantime until sight appears? You don't throw your confidence away. You instead go back. Listen to what it says. Second Kings or 1 Kings 18, the story continues. 
he, Elijah said to his servant, go and look toward the sea. And the servant went and looked. And he came back. There is nothing. For 15 years, Susan and I have been praying. And so far, all I can tell you is, hey, there's nothing except digression in the wrong direction. Nothing. But the next word says this. Seven times, Elijah said to the servant, go back. Count them with me. Go back. 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 One thing to say, go back. Another thing, when you're the servant, you've got a 20-mile journey to the Mediterranean Sea. Go back. And on the seventh time, the servant came back and he said, well, I had good news and bad news, Elijah. What's the good news? The good news is I saw a cloud. What's the bad news? It's only the size of a man's hand. Uh -huh. Elijah said, that's all I need. That's all I need. You go tell Ahab to, ch to cherry up, chariot, uh, harness up the horse and put it on the chariot because that's all I need. I just want you to know there's hardly been a day, if ever, in the last 15 years that I haven't asked God to heal my wife. And tomorrow morning, whether I choose to sit here or in my office or in the green room, I'm going back. Going back. And I want to encourage you, whatever your long-term struggle is, go back. Go back. And keep going back until God says to you, hey, there's a cloud. Faith continues regardless of what you see. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We live by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 10. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember, the great reward it brings you. Back to Hebrews. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will and then you will receive all that He has promised. It's humanly impossible for a man to run a long distance faster than a horse can draw a chariot. I tell you, it's just humanly impossible. But the Word of God says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezebel, and the power of the Lord came to Elijah, and tucking in his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Say it, I'm small. Are you there? I'm small. God's big. When the power of God chooses to come down, if ever, on you, you'll be bigger than you naturally are. And that day, the power of God came on this prophet after three and a half years of no rain. And he did what is humanly impossible. He outran a horse pulling a chariot with a man on it called the king. And he got there first. Listen, all I can tell you is our God's bigger than our problem. Third observation, and then I'm going to invite you to seek the Lord in whatever way you choose. Faith goes from small beginnings to grand finales. Faith goes from small beginnings to grand finales. I tend to be, maybe you are, I am. I'm an end in mind person. Just show me the results. If you interrupt me during my sermon writing, or when my door is closed in my office, the staff knows it better be for a bottom line reason. Like, okay, what's on your mind? But get to the point. Just get to the point. I, I want like, okay, what's the point? What is the point in God's life? What's the point of God in my life? 
one day, I'm pretty sure, we will get to heaven and we will finally realize that God did it just right. But between now and then, for you it will seem like a long time, but for God it's going to take just a little while. Just remember that a little while to God would be like a day to us. But to God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So when God says, just wait a little while, (laughs) don't misinterpret that he meant in an hour or two or a day or two. But could you just trust him? Faith is not an instant. It's a process. Faith is not an instant It's a process. Faith is being sure of what you hope for because God said it. And being certain of the things unseen because God already sees them. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Your destination is heaven, but your life here on earth is a process of faith to get there. And may God give us strength to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in his work. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. I love him. I believe he's sovereign. I believe he knows the end from the beginning. He knows where I am and he knows where I should be and he knows where eventually I'll get. In the process... I'm learning some things, and I'm sorry for all the, all the gaps. I'm sorry for what still is a mystery. Maybe you can help me. But together, I'm convinced that God wants us to press on toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus, one faith-filled step at a time. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I know it's late. If you have to leave, you're dismissed. Just just feel free to go. No penalties. No demerits. We're all going to just close our eyes, give you opportunity to leave. But if you're here and you really want to meet God in a physical way, you want to trust God in a faith step that you've never taken before, I just want to open it up to you and say, look, the words of James are for us. Are there any among you that are happy? Well, just rejoice. And are there any among you that are sick? Then call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil because you ask for it. And then acknowledge that if there is anything between you and God that you know is there, just confess it, but also say, I turn from that. and just step into the moment. So if there's someone here, and I believe there are several of us for various reasons, it's not just physical healing. I'm just going to ask you just quietly get up from your seat. I'm going to ask that those who are prepared to pray with folks, would you just come down and create some space here and clusters throughout all the way across from left to right, all the way along the front so people can have some privacy. If something merits what you think may be more privacy needed than this room offers, then then take them out of the room. But Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you to come. I believe that you've already spoken to us. The specifics now are individual. But Holy Spirit, move us. May we not be afraid of what people would say because they see us. May we just step into you. I want to encourage you without any hesitation, there will be no singing that will call you. The the invitation is now. Please just get up quietly from your seat. Those that have to leave, I understand that um, you, you, you very well might have to. You should not feel badly about that. So next week we'll talk about prosperity and money, misunderstandings thereof. But right now, As you leave, bring your friends back. Those of you who remain, feel free. Just come down. 
see God as you would choose to. And Holy Spirit, have your way now. Thank you for the story of Dave and Megan. Thank you for the story of Josie Smith, all in the same night. I believe that you have miracles for us in our future, Father. Things that will remind us, no, I'm still on the throne. I'm still working miracles. People are still coming to Jesus. Move among us freely, Holy Spirit, I pray. We're not in a hurry. This is all yours, Jesus.